Well, thank you all for coming. It's so nice uh, to have so many people coming out uh, to hear about what I'm thinking about. Um, so I'm going to try and give a little bit of a just kind of overview of where I'm coming from and the ideas that I've been exploring lately, um, and show you some of the work that I've been um, kind of focused on. And uh, feel free to ask some questions. We'll have more time for questions at the end, but if something comes up, um, yeah. So, uh, let's see, as Gary was saying, um, I did a kind of classic atelier training with Juliet Aristides. Um, so I had four years where we were working from a model every day, uh, drawing for the first year, painting in black and white for the second year, then finally moving into color uh, and doing cast drawings, uh, master copies, um, and so kind of really focusing in on these classical skills. So everything that I've been doing since then has kind of been making use of those skills and also reacting to those skills um, and kind of trying to break all of these rules that I was taught uh, and kind of redefine what works for me, like what feels like a rule that actually um, feels important from my own self uh, in my own work. Um, but it created this really strong foundation of basic kind of drawing and painting skills uh, that I've been able to work from. Um, so here's the... Uh, figure drawing from when I started. Uh, so we're doing drawing from the life from the live model every day. Um, How long are those poses? Really, like 40 hours. Really <laughs> long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so every day for about four weeks. Um, and cast. Um, and so basically, it was four years learning how to paint a single object under a single light source. And that is really hard to do. So having four years to try and get that um, was really helpful. Um, but uh, so this was kind of after I finished, I was in, the, in Paris for four months and, and did this master copy while I was at the Louvre, so getting to actually go and, and um, hang out with Rembrandt directly, um, which was, it was fun. He was the same age as I was when I was there, kind of doing this copy, oh, and I just like, I don't know, just like, can I hang out with this guy? Um, uh, working for a friend of mine. So as I was kind of finishing up that program, I had this idea um, that I was going to kind of take these skills that I've learned and then figure out kind of what subject matter I wanted to paint um, kind of very directly uh, with these skills. So these were the paintings right after I finished. Um, this was a self-portrait. Um, but then what I've been thinking about after I left um, was that it, for me it's become more interesting to think about kind of how we paint rather than what I paint. Um, that the very way that a painting is built carries more meaning than the subject matter does. Um, so to paint in one specific way um, means something. Um, and the way that I was taught was maybe more like the Duran painting uh, here. So these are all you know, four paintings of a tree from different eras, right? Um, and each of these paintings really um, has, a different, has a different meaning to it. Um, so if I, was paint, if I was taught to paint this way, uh, I don't feel like I can paint that way anymore. It feels like this, you know, this beautiful pastoral landscape that's like infused with like this light from God coming down onto the, onto the fields, and it's gorgeous. Like I love paintings like that, but I don't feel like um, me in the 21st century, like in my life right now, I don't feel like I can paint that way. Um, so I've been trying to figure out like how how I can incorporate more of this whole history of painting um, into my process and into the way that I'm working. Um, so absolutely loving these early frescoes from 2,000 years ago, uh, where it, it's kind of part of a whole room of paintings, uh, a, a, you know, a full wall, and it becomes more about this kind of flat surface of the wall becomes really present and ten, instead of just the kind of deep space that we have in the Duran. Um, the Modrian, or it, it, the, instead of being about a tree, it feels like it's about the rectangle. It's about kind of how the divisions of space are, are happening and those negative shapes become just as important as the positive shapes. Um, the whole space becomes kind of really activated. Um, the David Hockney is done on an iPad and is uh, kind of a really different kind of sense of saturated color, uh, kind of this weird color that we wouldn't get in paint. Um, and I just, I felt like there has to be a way to incorporate kind of the whole history of painting into what I'm doing, into, or at least into my thinking and, and into the kind of, um, kind of basis that I'm coming out of. Uh, so I wanted to have a process that um, didn't reject modernism, but kind of came out of um, these kind of traditional skills and also out of this kind of um, tradition of modern painting um, from the last 150 years or so. Um, 
So I went, so this was kind of when I was in graduate school. I got excited about these painters. But I felt like we're starting to put some of these things together. Um, and one of the things that was most exciting about these paintings to me was um, this aspect of kind of seeing the process in the painting. Um, so rather than kind of planning out a painting and then executing it perfectly, there's these aspects of kind of measuring marks and, and shifting bits of color um, that are going into these paintings and you can kind of see how the painting is built uh, in the very surface of the painting. Um, the, the case with these paintings as well. Uh, and, and that things are shifting over time, so that these are paintings that are observed and built over time. Um, and there's an earlier version of this painting with, with uh, Vaisandra where um, the, this figure is painted in and then it's been painted out, and the this, this sense of these, these surfaces being a place of investigation, of, of uh, an alive place where um, things are being kind of discovered, um, rather than kind of having a preconceived notion and, um, and just uh, then following through with that. So this was the first experiment that I did around time, um, where I worked just from my kind of uh, tabaret set up in my studio. And as I was working, things were changing every day. So it was um, kind of the paints and the stuff that I was using. And so every day I would come in and the whole setup would be kind of shifted. So I couldn't paint the way that I'd been taught. The way that I, the way that I was trained to paint was um, you know, doing a drawing, an accurate drawing, transferring that to a canvas, doing an underpainting, and then painting over it section by section. Um, and if the setup was changing every day, there was no way to do that process. So it sort of forced me to shift how I was working. And what I found kind of since then is that um, if there's something that I want to shift in my work, I can't just do it. Like I have to kind of create this little problem for myself that forces me to work in a, in a different manner. Um, so for this one, it was just having, it, having everything moving the whole time. Um, and I actually started it on these two pieces of canvas that were um, kind of put together, and then I decided actually to mount them onto a larger panel, um, so you can kind of see where those edges are, uh, so that even the, the dimensions of the canvas didn't have to be predetermined. The whole thing could be in flux all the time, um, so that I was working with color and, yes? Do you remember how long you spent on this one, roughly? Maybe a month or so, yeah. Yeah, so it just felt like it kind of opened everything up for me. Uh, and I had done a whole bunch more paintings kind of in that mode, experimenting with uh, kind of shifting time. Uh, so this was a space um, in the MFA building that other people were using uh, to build their canvases and things. So other people were changing the space every day. So I would come up and there would be a whole new setup for me to work from. Um, and, and there's kind of bits of what was before. Um, and I'm kind of chasing it and then finding the things that kind of make the painting stronger as I go. Um, this was when I was uh, living in San Jose, and there was a building that was going up right across from my studio. So I started this painting when it was at ground level and kind of attracted it as it was <laughs> So again, kind of following it along. Um, and it was never all at this state. Like this sort of shows different bits of the of the time that, that were happening, you know, kind of over the course of that year. Um, so I don't think the building ever looked quite like this, but it looked pieces of it looked like this at some point. Uh, and this was inside that studio space, um, that studio building. And again, there were kind of there was a bunch of stuff in there when I started painting it, and then it was moved out. And just sort of tracking these these spaces. Um, this one was also um, I, kind of, I wanted to expand the composition, so I sewed another piece of linen over there on the left. Um, so again, just feeling like not to be constrained by um, by the kind of things that had felt so rigidly controlled in that academic training um, has just felt really um, kind of freeing to me. Uh, and in, in the scope of what goes on in, in you know, contemporary painting, you know, these experiments are not that dramatic. But for me, to me, like um, in the utility training, we weren't supposed to make kind of square paintings because that's kind of a, a format you don't see in art history very much. Um, so like the first time I made a square painting, I felt like, whoa, <laughs> this is really wild. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's just been one thing after another. They're kind of getting, each one is kind of taking me um, further and further um, into these investigations. Um, so here, let's see if this works. This is a little video. Does that play on here? No, I don't think it will. That won't work. Okay, we won't do that. No problem. Oh, that will yeah. actually. All right, so here's a kind of a painting that I built. Uh, that um, this, this is not how I normally built a painting, but this is a, another experiment where I was um, kind of making a video as I went and, and letting more changes happen than I've ever had happen before. Uh, so, and this process 
kind of allowed me to then make really drastic changes in paintings after that. So again, felt like a very um, kind of a breakthrough painting for me uh, as I was working on it. Um, but I was thinking about kind of building up a narrative here and uh, like deliberately making those changes happen so that it would sort of create this little um, tiny bit of a narrative arc to it. Uh, so. Did you work at it with the idea of this um, video being played? Yeah, that was. So I was trying to kind of make a video yeah. as part of the of the project. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And my my plan was to actually go all the way back to basically Lee White in the painting and then <laughs> chicken <it> out. <laughs> 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 But uh, did you decide to like shoot at the end of every session, or if you saw something that you thought? No, I was shooting. I was shoot, like I had a kind of a tripod set up, and so I was basically it was great because it made me step back all the time, which you always want to do in your painting, anyways. But I would go up and like paint a couple strokes, step back, take a photo, go, go back mm -hmm. and paint. What um, was so your reference? Did you have? A I had, this was all from observation. So oh, okay. I had this set up in my studio, and then these friends came in and modeled for me. Uh, for it. Um, yeah, and they came in separately at different times. And, uh, yeah, so and then this is my ex-boyfriend who gets erased here in a very. Shows the struggle, you know, and you leave part of it in, which shows the str it's like a ghost of the struggle. Which yeah, so I like how I like how that um, sense of the process kind of complicates the surface, and the surface becomes this kind of rich uh, kind of uh, artifact of what yeah. of the painting that was there, um, rather than you know, rather than kind of being it, it's both kind of a finished product, but it's also this sort of sense of. Um, this is a place where I observed things and I experimented and things happened and this surface kind of contains all of that. Yeah. Um, so in the same series, this was a lemon tree that I had in my studio that grew over a, a series of months and it started, I think I started the painting when it had you know, a little tiny, uh, tiny you know, green lemon and it grew into a full fruit and getting to kind of track those changes. And a communal kitchen where, again, people are setting up that still life for me every day. <laughs> I, I've gotten really excited about still life since I figured out you don't have to set them up. I hated, I hated the still life because it felt like, like this process of like agonizingly trying to set up this arrangement of things um, was not fun for me. Um, but this process of um, finding things is just like so engaging. Um, and and the, I think that the paintings feel more alive to me because I'm finding them as I go, and the compositions become more interesting to me than anything I could have preconceived. I think um, my first idea in my head is always pretty schematic and boring, um, and when I'm actually observing objects in the world, they're much more peculiar and much more um, particular and, and exciting to me. Uh, yeah. For something like this, where you find it, do you take your easel like into the kitchen, or yeah. do you take a photo? No, I was, I was going into the kitchen every day and kind of working from what was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I took some photos as I went. Like sometimes I would take, I would you know take a photo um, during the painting session, and then um, you know if, if it was gone the next day and I kind of wanted that, I could look back at it. But um, yeah, basically just following following what was there. So how many paintings do you work on at a time? <laughs> I think that the, the, the best number for me seems to be about five. Right now I have like ten things going in the studio right now and it's a little like I'm a little overwhelmed because I feel like how am I going to finish all this but um, with five I can kind of have something like I, I always have this kind of initial like huge energy for a project and I'm like oh this is going to be the best painting ever and I like paint on it and I know exactly what needs to happen and I get you know I, I, I work and I work and then it gets to a place where it's like oh okay <laughs> this is not the best painting uh, that's ever been and then to let it have time to kind of sit and work on other things and come back to it and keep kind of coming back to it over a series of many months has been really helpful. Um, like there was a question back in here. Yeah, I was just curious. This is a pretty different way of approaching 
painting and you know how you spent a lot of time before. Yeah. It seems like you took to it pretty well. Was it a natural fit, or did yeah. you ever have moments where you're like, I don't know how to make this decision. I don't know what I'm doing. This has felt pretty natural. I think that the process I was taught in school felt um, felt very really constrained to me, and this has felt kind of. Um, more engaged, I guess, um, where I felt like I, everything, like all of the planning happened first and then you would kind of just execute it and I um, felt like my brain kind of got turned off at that point in some ways, like it was fun to learn how to kind of render form really carefully, um, but in this way like I have to be, I have to be fully awake kind of all the way through the process um, and that feels really good to me, like I feel like I can get more of my, like my energy into the painting if I'm fully engaged with it all the way, all the way through. Um, in that way. It certainly has brought up other problems, like I get to these paintings where the composition is, I, I'm like not sure how to resolve it and um, not sure how to make them work and that certainly... You just let it sit for a while usually? Yeah. Come back to it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another idea that I've been thinking about, kind of again in comparison to that academic training was um, instead of the kind of figure being the unit of measurement, that, you know, that single figure, um, Thinking about the, the composition as the like the whole rectangle as the unit of measurement and how the whole um, the whole painting fits together. So I've been loving these Vuillard paintings where the, the figures feel like they're almost camouflaged into the space. Like it's it's like it's kind of hard to find all these figures in here almost. Um, and you have to do a lot to hide a figure. So I've been thinking about how to um, kind of integrate the figures into that whole environment, uh, which has been a real challenge. Um, so some of these are. Um, kind of thinking about how to how to have those figures sitting into a into a full space, uh, and how to get the, the whole canvas working rather than um, just thinking about the figure and then having the environment be kind of secondary, having the whole thing kind of all come up together, um, and to try and and different ways to kind of almost slow our down our reading of the painting. So trying to kind of bring our attention to this theme of light and the still life on the table and really subdue the figure over here um, so that that doesn't become the first thing that we immediately see. Mm -hmm. uh, and same with these, gal the, these uh, sculptures, thinking about trying to kind of camouflage them into this <coughs> pile of junk in the studio. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious that in the last few um, slides you've gone from a pretty bright, high chroma stuff to very middle value. Mm. Uh, is that like a long-term transition, or is it just, I feel like doing this today and tomorrow I'll do something else? <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about color okay. in the next, I think the next section. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, so yeah, I, um, maybe I'll get to that in a sec. Okay, okay. cool. Yeah. So again, thinking about the whole space and kind of, uh, and these figures as part of an environment, how we're kind of reading these figures in their spaces. It also turns it into a narrative. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think that that relationship of the figure to the environment becomes becomes a yeah the beginning of a narrative, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Nice color. <laughs> All right. So um, yeah. So that with again with the academic training, everything was very value focused. So we were we were really focused on getting accurate values, and color was a bit of an afterthought. Um, it felt like color was sort of an overlay, but not an actual kind of way that we're structuring the composition. The compositions were all structured around value. Um, so I've been looking at, at paintings that are that are kind of structured around color um, as a, as another kind of just broadening of the of the painting language. Um, and uh, originally, I, I, again, kind of setting up these problems for myself. Um, there's some nice, just other kind of painters who are using color. Um, my, my paintings were all really, really neutral. And with each of these things, I sort of thought it was my own personal vision, and then I realized it was actually just kind of coming out of this training. So I had this idea that like, oh, I just, I really like this kind of frontal one object in the center of a, of a painting. Like that feels really strong and kind of epic and, um, and then I realized, like, no, that everybody's doing that. That's just sort of what we learned how to do. Um, or that I really like these kind of subtle, neutral paintings. And I still, I love subtle, neutral grays. Um, but again, that was sort of my default. And I, and I keep wanting to kind of question what my default is with how I'm working. Um, so with these, I, I set up this problem of using um, kind of colored construction paper. 
um, so that nothing in the still life setup was gray. So I couldn't paint any of those neutral grays um, because the entire world was either kind of grouped around pink or grouped around blue or these different kind of color um, schemes um, that would kind of force me to, to make that shift. So the same is with that kind of time painting of my tabaret. It's like I have to, I have to kind of physically set up the world so that I will uh, shift the way that I'm working. Um, so again, I put kind of colored construction paper on the wall for this model. Uh, so that she would be in this chromatic environment. Uh, and then here was a, another experiment where I was trying to kind of get accurate value and color relationships, but they're all within like the most compressed range uh, I could possibly do. So everything is keyed in this red, but I have kind of cool, uh, cool reds to warm reds and lighter to darker, um, but all very, very compressed. And also kind of keying around like a greenish in here. So the um, kind of color in those leaves um, was purple with these green striations. And I ended up thinking about kind of keying the whole environment around it with that kind of greenish tone. Um, so again, that the color relationships feel accurate, but they're all kind of tipped to one in one direction or another. Uh, is there a question? Yeah. You set up some scenarios that forced you to use color. But in that last one, were you saying that you read the color information and then translated it? Yeah. That yeah. Okay. So in both of these, this was, I was uh, yeah. doing this from observation of an actual table. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was working from a full color um, observationally and then just, and I ended up painting this several times to get it that red, like I kept making things brownish. Um, yeah. But started finally seeing those as relationships uh, that felt right um, after working on it for a while. Um, yeah, and same here, it's like I, the wall was white, but I was kind of like, oh, I wonder if that could actually be, what if that wall was actually green? How would everything be in relationship to that if that wall was green? Um, yeah, so the next thing that I've kind of been experimenting with is these kind of elements of abstraction in the work. Um, and I think, again, coming out of this academic training, I felt like abstraction, um, you know, was not something I was looking at. And I've gotten increasingly just um, kind of entranced by it and excited by these shapes. And, like, that this, that this painting is just incredibly compelling to me. And I'm not quite sure why in some ways. Um, but the, the way that the kind of confusion of how these shapes are broken up um, is really exciting to me, the sort of jarring jumps from one shape to the next. Um, that doesn't quite make sense in, in our kind of um, how we actually see things in the world um, is really surprising. Uh, so as kind of compositional problems have come up, I've started using sometimes just a kind of color shape uh, to see if that will solve the compositional problem. Um, and then sometimes I'll end up adding objects back in. Uh, but here was a, a painting where things kind of got divided into these different uh, kind of different shapes uh, as, I was, as I was going through. I was also thinking about kind of a warm, cool setup. So the light up here was warm and, and, and cooler at the bottom. And again, kind of with keying the color, I was thinking like, OK, so what if it actually was like red up top instead of just being kind of warm? Um, and what if it was really blue on the bottom? And, and, and can I get those both to work in one painting? Um, so I've been really excited by these sort of formal aspects of painting and getting to try out um, just trying out these kind of simple investigations with, um, with still life because it, it, it sort of allows me, like the objects themselves are so mundane and so simple. Um, like it's, this is my washer dryer unit from my <laughs> previous apartment. Um, and like it's not as exciting on its own, but, um, but it, it sort of gives this opportunity to explore painting in a very direct way. Um, that the, it has to be the color and the value and those, those relationships in the painting that make it compelling uh, because the subject matter itself is pretty, is, is pretty every day. Um, so here's another kind of in the bathroom. Uh, this is kind of, it, it ends up reading kind of like a beam of light, but that shape wasn't actually there. Um, so that was, again, kind of, I started the painting and then it wasn't working as a painting and I ended up kind of adding these sort of abstract shapes to it that then made it feel like it came together as a, as a painting. So that was one that sat for a while where um, it felt pretty bland and then it so kind of... So you set up an easel in your house? Or... Yeah, this was in the, yeah, in the bathroom. In the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Many days in the bathroom. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. This was my boyfriend's bathroom. It was over the summer. It was nice to hang out in there. So, and uh, yeah, this was the view from the kitchen into the laundry room. Uh, just these very simple scenes. But I, I get excited by the kind of formal like aspects of them. What's that? Do you like doing laundry? <laughs> <laughs> They're good white shapes, though. Like white shapes catch light in a really beautiful way. I don't know. Yeah. Don't like doing laundry, though. Uh, uh, well, that's how you avoid doing laundry. Yeah, so you can't touch the laundry machine. It's in the process. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, this, is this is the same bathroom. This is the bathroom window next, right next to the other view. Uh, but again, kind of keying the color. This one's kind of keyed around green. Um, where, where, that, it, it's painted white, but uh, you know, it, again, the color kind of felt greenish to me, and then kind of seeing how far can I push that. Um, how much time do you put on these pieces? Yeah. Long time. Oh. The, the weird thing is that even if they're pretty rough, they end up taking as long as these really refined things do. Because I'm kind of repainting over and over again um, to try and get it to work. Um, so, yeah, it's maybe a couple. What size is that piece? Around, it's like light, everything's kind of life sized right now. I'm really enjoying painting life size. So, this one's, um, it's the same size as the washer dryer, as the, the laundry room one upstairs. Maybe, 30 inches high or so? Yeah. So what size is it? <laughs> <laughs> How do you know when you finish? <laughs> that is tough. Uh, I, I, it's become less about the kind of refined finish um, and more about um, getting the like feeling of the thing, like it's sort of resonating internally, which is hard to define. Um, or. or and more formally, just like not catching my eye anywhere so that I can sit and look at it and my eye will keep moving through and nothing will kind of catch me and, and, and bother me. Um, so for this, like, you know, there's all these kind of rough bits to it, but I felt like I was able to just sort of settle in and, and feel like I could kind of move through that as a painting and it felt um, like that was working for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've been doing a series of windows. It's really fun. I don't, I, I don't know. I like these window spaces, kind of getting to look in on people and look out. Um, so these were I was in Berlin for a month, uh, two summers ago, and I was just spying on the neighbors the whole time. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> And again, I guess I've also started working in series and feeling like there doesn't have to be one version of a thing. Um, that these are kind of the same set of windows that I'm looking at and that there's a version at night, there's a version in the day, there's someone in there, and that all of these different ways of making a painting of it can exist at the same time. Which maybe has also felt freeing instead of feeling like there's this one version of an idea that I have to get perfect. Feeling like, oh, I can kind of iterate and figure out all the different ways this thing can exist in the world. Um, all right, so the next idea I've been thinking about is pictorial space. Uh, so really compelled by these paintings that, that are kind of looking further back in history and looking further forward in history. Um, so I had learned how to kind of make, act, like how to create space in painting in that training, how to really clearly define um, what's in the foreground and what's in the background. Um, but starting to get interested in these ways that kind of flatten space. So these early, these early paintings and these modern paintings feel like they have something in common to me. The space becomes kind of flatter and weirder. Um, you know, the ellipse on this uh, vase is all wrong. Uh, but it's just gorgeous. Like, there is, it feels so alive and felt. It's like a way of an, engaging in the world um, that isn't presented to you. It's not like setting up a, a row of um, you know, still life objects on a shelf. It's, a, it's the way we're actually engaged in the world, where we're looking down on things and things are kind of tipping up at us and we're looking at them from different angles. Um, and they feel like they're thinking about the whole surface. So that, it, that um, I don't know, this Cezanne, like this, uh, this table doesn't continue over in a strange way. Like it, it, doesn't, it doesn't maybe work logically, but it works pictorially. Like that whole painting just feels incredibly solid to me as a painting. Um, even if the things are tipping and, and being kind of um, uh, a little off kilter in their actual um, space. Does that make sense? Um, so I've been trying this kind of, I read this book um, called Changing Images of Pictorial Space by William Dunning. And I went through and um, kind of did this series of paintings 
uh, based on each chapter of the book, just getting to kind of try out these ideas. So this was from the first chapter where we're looking at Roman frescoes and thinking about kind of looking at things from multiple perspectives. Um, so in the, in the fresco painting, we're both kind of, the, the bowl is like tipping towards us so we can see all the fruit, but then we're also seeing the kind of clean ellipse on the bottom as if we're looking at it from down below. Uh, so I made a painting where I'm looking, uh, standing half of the time and sitting half of the time, and trying to kind of see if I can incorporate those two different perspectives into one painting and just letting them be there uh, with the same painting. And again, just picking something really <coughs> stupid that I could paint over and over again um, and get to explore these ideas. Um, so the next one I was thinking about was the Chimabue. And again, these feel spatially similar to me, where there's this weird reversal that happens of the, the kind of yellow, the background starts to push forward and, and flip, like the image sort of reverses, where if you look at the negative space, it pops forward, and if you look at the positive space, it, it comes forward, so there's this kind of fighting in the space um, that really flattens things and confuses things, and like, wow, that's really exciting to have that happen. Um, and also there's these kind of small, there, we don't have a sense of big volumes, but we have the sense of like little volumes, kind of um, the texture of the fabric becomes kind of rendered fully. Uh, and the way that the charcoal is going on and the decooning all feels similar to that, the way it's kind of breaking up these little spaces. Um, Was this, the stuff that you've been showing us recently here, is that after or before your color study time? It's, it's all sort of, the, the, this has been the more more recent investigation, okay. but um, the you, you so study color. I feel like each of these things, I, I'm like trying things out and there's things that I then, that I grab onto from what I'm trying and then that kind of carries through and then other bits of it that just sort of get set aside where I, I think like, oh, well, that was interesting, but I don't need to keep doing that. Um, so some of the color stuff has continued for sure. Um, and the time stuff has continued. Like I think that all of these things have sort of, um, been integrating into into most of the work I'm doing now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is my Chimabue Doritos painting. Um, uh, so playing with that kind of flipping space and um, rather than having kind of a cleanly articulate, you know, the 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 floor, the you know, the ground plane is like as if it's just flat uh, rather than in perspective, and just getting to to kind of play with confusing the space that way. Um, here's the getting into moving forward to the Baroque, uh, thinking about space that's kind of coming out of a narrow, um, kind of a shallow space that then projects forward towards the viewer. Uh, so we you know, tend to have these like knife edge coming over the tabletop or a lemon peel coming down over the edge of the table in a Baroque painting. Um, so here I just have this kind of card coming off and thinking about having the, the sandwich and all of that kind of project forward. Um, let's see. Again, like I, I've always loved Titian, and I'm starting to feel like that Franz Klein like has like the same energy in some way that that Titian does. Like it has the same strength of composition, and it just blows my mind that that can be the case. Um, so, and, and these paints like they're organized in a very similar way, from big shapes to small shapes. They're both kind of value-oriented paintings, but they have these bits of color that move through them. Um, just beautiful. Um, so this was my Franz Klein paintings, uh, where I was thinking about kind of organizing the, again, I'm like looking down on a pile of laundry here, uh, and uh, thinking about kind of organizing the rectangle in terms of this big dark shape with a little bit of color that moves through it. Yes? Are you mixing something in the paint to get that texture? I'm just painting really thickly, over, kind of over and over again, as I'm trying to figure these things out. Um, so the paint is just building up slight kind of layers yeah. of crustiness. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they're not, I'm not adding any medium or texture thing. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, this one on the right was the first like abstract painting I made ever. Uh, and um, just getting to like, again, looking at that same pile of laundry, but totally losing the, losing the representational aspect of it. Um, kind of letting myself do that. Uh, it was exciting. Yeah. All right, so then we're moving on to pop art and thinking about Rauschenberg. Um, and I did this series of, of kind of two views of these cleaning products here. Um, so thinking about kind of pop art with these kind of bold colors and, and recognizable labels. Uh, and then this um, Rauschenberg approach of just adding all this kind of junk into the painting um, and using some of the actual objects, uh, the, you know, the actual cardboard of that um, trash container thing. Uh, yeah. What did you use for the glue? 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think I used, um, I've been using, what is it, the Gorilla Glue. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty strong. Yeah. And kind of adding paint and adding more stuff and kind of gluing it together and just letting it sort of build up in a way that I, I've never let myself do before. Uh, so these have just been really fun to get to, um, to get to experiment. Yeah. So, how's everybody doing? I feel like we're losing attention in the back here. Are you guys able to hear me right? All right. So I felt like the, the still life has been this um, kind of free place to do these little experiments. And then in the figurative work I've been, or in the figure, the figure paintings, I've been trying to kind of put that all together a little bit more. Um, so trying to kind of integrate these different ideas of color and space and time and um, make a full painting. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is my awkward dinner party painting. <laughs> Where everybody's just like fully expressing how they're actually feeling. <laughs> yeah, like doing the kind of uh, buffled up version of it. Uh, <laughs> Um, this is my house party, and this one was an, uh, another kind of experiment that I did where I was mainly finding all the, maybe all of them, I think all of the images I found online from image searches. So I was just working from photos and kind of collaging them together in this, uh, into this painting, um, and making a lot of changes as I went um, still, but kind of trying to piece this together into a painting. Uh, here's my backyard brunch based on the Velasquez. <laughs> so I've been, um, as I've been trying to do these multiple figure compositions, it feels like a really hard challenge. And one of the ways I've been kind of figuring that out is by looking at these historical paintings. Um, and some of them are very directly kind of just uh, referencing and stealing from these historical paintings to create my compositions. Um, but then letting them kind of evolve and, and, and take on their own terms uh, so that they're working kind of as, as their own paintings. Um, and then other ones like the, the dinner party, whoops, like the dinner party one that we showed before was um, kind of looking at a lot of historical paintings but then completely, you know, building my own composition um, for that one. But these have been really fun. Um, and then this was this giant wedding painting that I did um, this last year uh, that was based on the Jericho painting. Uh, so again, kind of using that kind of compositional structure as the armature to then um, kind of pose people um, and um, kind of mimic that light source and the structure of the space uh, to build my own painting. So I was thinking about combining that um, kind of uh, Baroque composition as the armature and then thinking about a different sense of space and light. Um, so bringing together the Giotto with these kind of weird structures that feel um, very kind of artificial, um, but really compelling and kind of weird. Uh, and the like, Piero della Francesca, um, kind of these big, big rounded shapes that are all pushing up against one another and really filling the space. Um, so that all the figures are kind of these big volumes that are all right pressed up against each other. Um, so I was thinking about how to kind of bring together a bunch of these different ideas into one painting. Um, and. Uh, and letting everybody be as big as they can possibly be in that space. Yeah. Are you now working from life and photos and whatever you want in these? This one was mainly photos. Okay. Yeah. So I was taking my own reference photos of all the figures um, and then doing some image searches for some of the other aspects of it. Um, I was like searching for wedding venues for a while, which was kind of fun. Um, this is a place in LA that I've never been to, uh, but I changed a lot. Uh, and made into this kind of my own structure. Um, but yeah, so I'm sort of putting a, a lot of different sources together for these. Um, and again, and kind of there's these, there's these places where I, I tried to just use kind of um, just kind of blocks of color or um, value to, to make things work, to kind of move my eye through. Um, and then sometimes it actually becomes an object. So I have this kind of diagonal black line kind of in front of this table for a while, and then I ended up adding another plant there because uh, the, the shape didn't hold it enough. But so I'm kind of going back and forth between these kind of abstract elements and um, representational elements. How big is that? It's 8 by 12, basically. Uh, so it's quite large. Yeah. It's only a quarter of the, the size of the Jericho. 
So it's, it's, it's wow. half, half, the, half the dimensions, but you know, a quarter of the square footage. So it's quite small. Yeah, gotta go bigger. Um, and then looking at some painters who are going, uh, who are doing uh, abstract work and just getting really excited by this. Um, I, I feel like the things that I love about representational painting are actually their kind of formal aspects. It's about the the relationship of, of light shapes to dark shapes. It's about it's about the color relationships. Um, and I think that's what made me kind of um, get excited about abstraction in that in that it's just about those relationships. And those are what made me love painting all along. Um, so uh, so I've been trying to kind of experiment with um, breaking up these forms even more. Uh, so we can kind of a kaleidoscope painting. Uh, maybe a little too bright. Um, and, 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 and painting them in a way where I start to really lose, lose some of the form. Um, so this was a more recent one that I finished uh, where I'm really kind of tiptoeing into some abstract work, uh, which I'm, again, I'm not sure if I, I get, well, like, what's going to stick. I'm, going, I'm doing some more kind of fully representational paintings again right now, but then I have another abstract one going. And um, kind of each of these things, I feel like I have to try it on, and um, then uh, parts of it will kind of continue through, and, and parts of it will be sort of naturally kind of set aside. Is that large also? Six, uh, yeah, five and a half by six feet. Um, so I really like working large. I've been, I've been doing a lot of larger paintings now, um, and often just working things like everything's life size. So the, in the wedding, all the figures are life size, or you know, the sandwiches are life size, so they're only about this big. Uh, but um, yeah, I think that's that's all my slides here. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. process you find out you enjoy more where you control the environment you're painting or the environments being controlled by other people oh I don't know um, I think in most of them I'm controlling it I guess um, yeah it has been freeing when when it's out I of see my that control work, actually but someone else but is controlling it or you walk into space and you can't set things in yeah the no I really did like that I have but I haven't been doing that as much that's interesting maybe I should go back and do some more of that because <laughs> that was kind of good yeah I think I, I do I um yeah I think I like both of those things well I just see it's yeah. more and I'm still when you do it when someone else is moving things around and you kind of rearrange right and I'm still kind of controlling the paintings I'm still picking yeah from that environment, what I'm adding in and what I'm taking out, and sort of finding my way to something. Um, but yeah, getting to kind of just take from the environment. Yeah. All right. I'm going to assume that in your training you had studies that were preparatory for mm -hmm. the piece. Yeah. Do you have that same kind of spin up, or do you work it all out? There is everything you start something right. It's been a mix. So some yeah. of them are all worked out on the surface, like including the dimensions of the painting, <laughs> um, and then these big. Um, yeah. That's fine. Anything. No. Oh. We're just gonna leave an image up. Oh yeah. Well, I'll go to the wedding one. Then we'll take the point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There we go. Um, but for a painting like this, I did um, sketches and um, a series of kind of small gouache studies where I'm working things out. And again, a lot of it changed over time. It, it didn't all stay with my initial plan, but I was working a lot of it out, as much as I could out before I started. Yeah. So if you do a small gouache study, mm -hmm. do you take the whole thing in and do like less values, value study and all? Yeah. And you just do parts of it at a time? No, I was working on the whole thing. Okay. So, I'm, so I'm working very, so I think I had like, like an inch to a foot ratio basically, yeah. so I had like a kind of eight inch um, little you know piece of paper and I'm each head is just like two strokes, you know, a light side and a dark side. And I'm just trying to work out the whole composition about how is it, how is this whole space gonna work. Um, I'm less worried about painting a head because I've done that training where I've spent four years learning how to paint a head under a light source. Um, I'm much more worried about how do I how do I organize an entire canvas. That, that, that feels really that feels really challenging. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm curious about your commercial experience, uh -huh. uh, gallery-wise. Um, yeah. And personally, like, if 
finding a series that you love and then wanting to flip and jump, uh -huh. do you get a lot of backlash from People, galleries or collectors? Or? Right. People like Gary have been remarkably uh, <laughs> like uh, laid back about letting me do this. Um, he took me on right after the Atelier when I was doing that very traditional work. Um, and has been incredibly supportive of me experimenting, so I feel, really appreciate that here. We don't take uh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Everything. Um, and some of it's kind of fun. Like it, basically, it's it's been I've been really lucky, and it's been working. Um, so I so there's some new galleries I've been starting to work with who show um, who don't focus on representational painting, who focus kind of more in a broader art market, and um, I'm on the more representational side of what they show. Um, yeah. So I think that that works. She's um, now in Amsterdam, Boston, New York, small place in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> Full time studio or a teaching? I'm doing a little bit of um, workshops. So I'm out here in Nashville teaching a three day workshop right now, um, and so I do a few of those every year, um, and then teaching. Uh, so and then teaching a little bit in my studio and then painting. So I'm trying to do 10 percent teaching, 90 percent painting. It's the current ratio, which is, that feels pretty good. Um, yeah, um, but it is funny. Like I did those. I felt like I was deliberately this past couple years, like the sandwiches. Like I deliberately wanted to paint stuff that wasn't sellable because of its subject matter. Like I'm kind of um, like I, I, there, there's one you know nude woman up there, but I think that might be the last one for a while. Like I don't want to paint like young pretty girls, and I don't want to paint like cut flowers. Like I've been <laughs> deliberately wanting to paint these like kind of weird and, and unappealing things. And then they haven't been selling quite as quickly. <laughs> I was like, wait, this is this. Um, I, I like I, I I did that on purpose, and then I've been kind of bummed that they haven't gone as fast. What was I thinking? Of course they don't. Yeah. But. There are some paintings we could have sold three of, but she doesn't do them over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've been and I've been trying to just really. I think it can be a problem when you're a young painter, where you can kind of get stuck in either kind of teaching or. Um, kind of get one type of work that is selling and get kind of just kind of keep on a on a roll of doing that and I really want to I don't know to like let myself follow this path and see like but let the art feel like it's kind of leading me forward and um, uh, be willing to, to do that uh, which is a little it's a little strange to be doing that kind of in public and uh, you know um, but that's what's happening so. well two more questions all right any more questions? I have a question. Yeah. Are you a naturally very neat and organized person or a very messy person? <laughs> <laughs> I am a somewhat messy person who wishes I was cleaner. I can say, but I want to bear Yes. No, I think it's wonderful how you uh, create the spaces out of like such interesting objects. Mm. Some of the spaces are messy, like there, there are a bunch of them are in my boyfriend's apartment and he was like, you're making my apartment look terrible! <laughs> <laughs> it's not that messy! And I was like, eh, it kind of is. And just add a few extra things on the floor. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious, are you painting on stretch canvas in, in all the time? Or you work on Rarely. The, the really large ones are on stretched linen, um, uh, but mainly I've been really liking working on panels or, or linen mounted on panels. I kind of like that rigid surface. Yeah. Um, so I've been losing, using those aluminum composite panels a lot, um, but anything that gets, um, you know, over four feet starts to get quite heavy in a panel form. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you share like a vulnerability in your work or like a struggle? Is there anything that, because you had such classical heavy training, are there, like do you struggle with figure at all or form? Like what's something that you hit the canvas and you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I feel like I keep trying things that, that become a struggle. Um, like I'm trying, I, so I'm working on like another abstract painting right now that's another six foot, it's like six feet tall, and it's it like it's really hard, and I don't know, and I don't know what I'm doing, and it feels it feels really really hard, um, and it's currently has its face to the wall. To look at it. Like, like, it, like I feel like I was getting somewhere and like in it, and then I and then I was out of it, and I was just sort of. Um, like doing this sort of decorative thing where I was just sort of painting shapes that I thought would look nice together instead of actually being inside the painting and and um, uh, and doing something that felt more kind of genuine. Um, no preconceived notion. That that feels like, like impossible. I don't know how do you, how do people do this. Um, yeah. 
Um, One more question. But there's, uh, and making these big complex paintings feels incredibly challenging to me. Um, getting getting the whole thing to work um, is really, that, that feels... Um, you succeeded. <laughs> yeah. I feel like this one worked. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on another. I'm working on an, another large one right now, and it's not. Uh, it's not looking like this yet. <laughs> I don't have a. I don't have a photo in the slideshow for a reason. Yeah. We have one more question. One more. Yeah. Was there another oh, question? Good. I'm good. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's go um, around. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. That's amazing. All right.